Hi, I'm Jordan. I'm not Australian, but I want you to drink more Australian wine. So here goes. Although winemaking goes back longer in Australia than the Americas, the Aussies have a refreshing lack of any kind of obligation to tradition. Uh, so they're much more likely to take chances and innovate. Now, their method of trying everything everywhere, they bottle and sell what works and I guess they drink what doesn't, um, makes them one of the most exciting, dynamic countries to watch. So every time you think you know Australian wine, they put out something cool that no one has done before. Now that's not to say that there's no tradition there. In fact, it goes back a long time. And as a caveat, I am leaping in Olympic bounds over most of Australian history, both pre and post colonization. We are just looking at the wines. So Australian historians, earmuffs. I think they were running out of British names to recycle by the time they founded New South Wales. Uh, it sounds like New South Surrey or New Langley Business Development Zone. But in 1788, the British colony of New South Wales was established by the First Fleet, which was 11 ships sailing from England. With the loss of the American colonies in the Revolution, uh, Britain was eager to colonize such a large land rich in resources. That's why it's always been curious to me that the first wave of colonists they sent didn't want to go there at all. It was a penal colony, an open air prison with no walls. The first fleet contained 348 free people, that includes about 200 Marines, 696 convicts, 192 of which were female. But also on that first fleet was vine cuttings taken from the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. Now these First plantings failed, but by the 1820s, as colonization spread and farmers began to understand that foreign Australian landscape, some wines were being exported back to England, where they won the first overseas award. They continued to win awards and gold medals in Europe throughout the 19th century. In 1876 in Vienna, some French judges in a blind tasting praised some of the wines from the Hunter Valley until they found out what the wines were. Then they just went home. They said, this is not good, we go home. But given how long it took to send anything to England by sailboat, there was a lot of spoilage. So in the 1850s, just as Australia's gold rush brought a massive influx of new immigrants to the continent, most wine production turned to port-style fortified wines called stickies that would make the journey to England where the port market was huge. I mean, it still is. In the 20th century, however, as sugar became more ubiquitous and thus no longer a luxury, Sweet wines fell out of favor, and a lot of the productive regions turned to other crops. There just wasn't any money in wine. After a visit to France in 1950, Penfold's cheap winemaker, Max Schubert, decided to try and make a prestige dry wine. Problem was, he worked for a company that made stickies for a century, and they had no desire to take a risk. But Max did it anyway, often in secret, and the wine he made, Penfold's Grange, slowly made its way around the world's wine circles and started turning heads. So where before Australian wine was a global joke, I mean, there's even a Monty Python skit mocking it, Grange gave Australia credibility and collectors like me started taking the country seriously. Today, modern Australia is the fourth largest exporter of wine. Although in terms of production, it's seventh behind Italy, France, Spain, the US, Argentina, and even China. Australians drink about as much wine per capita as we do, which is to say a moderate amount, well below most European countries. But where Canadian production is small, and we mostly drink it all, Australia makes way more wine and is therefore dependent on exports. And I think that's where some of this market change happened. Of the last few number one top selling wines in BC, two of them, Wolf Blast Yellow Label and Yellowtail Shiraz, dominated our market for years, and whenever that happens, copycats pop up. And these copycat Australian wines, I won't name names, but we in the industry call them critter wines, began a race to the bottom, both in price and quality, that started to dilute and cheapen the country's image. Many wine drinkers started to move away from Australia, regardless of the fact that the best Aussie producers never stopped making amazing wines. Now that's starting to change. A younger batch of winemakers has emerged and started moving away from big, huge Shiraz, not that there's anything wrong with that. And uh, wine snobs like me are looking at Down Under with fresh eyes. So Lisa and I are going to explore the different regions of Australia and what makes it one of the most exciting wine producing countries in the world. 
Cris Jones. 